Hello, my name is Jason Engerman, and we're here with Designers for Learning. And today is our uh, very first Ed Impact Day, and we thank everyone for joining us. And Designers for Learning is a nonprofit um, academic service learning platform that really reaches out across the globe to try to engage educational technologists, instructional designers in providing and designing OERs for adult basic education. We have a MOOC. Massive Open Online Course. It's running for the second time this year in the fall semester, and that will be closing December 4th. Uh, but so as far as this conversation goes, we are looking to expand our notion of what the educational community looks like and what it does toward the impact that it would make um, for the social good. And with us, we have a very personal friend of mine, uh, my advisor, and friend, and colleague, and um, just a very special person in Ali Card Shellman. She was the department head of uh, learning performance systems at Penn State University for five, six years. She has an incredible almost 20 year history in research with over 120 publications and has done incredible, incredible work around boys and gaming around um, unheard voices, which includes migrant workers, uh, homeless and um, the prison. Um, among many, 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 many other things and accolades. And currently she serves as the Dean of Education at Idaho University. And this is a, a new position, the University of Idaho, our University of Idaho. And so she's got lots of things to share with us on, on paradigm change, on systemic thinking and change, on learning and, and, and the learning design field as a whole as uh, one of our luminaries and in particular i believe she wants to start off with the construct of uh, public intellectualism and the purpose of uh, our role as scholars as academics as we consider ourselves in society and how we change and how we uh, implement and engage in that space so on that note i'm going to kick it off to ali to just kind of start us off with what do you like <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I appreciate that introduction, Jason. And yes, uh, I'm, I'm interested in talking a little bit with you today about public intellectualism. Um, this has been an interest of mine for some time. And um, I think at least in part because of the TED talk that I did five or six years ago now um, that sort of launched me into a more public space in terms of my scholarship than I had been in the past and gave me an opportunity to really explore what public intellectualism was about, where we are with the state of public intellectualism today, um, and how our field might be involved, even education more generally, uh, might be involved in public intellectualism. So a lot of us feel that we are able to um, produce really good scholarship, and, and, and in many cases, we, we do that scholarship in part because we want to inform our colleagues in, in, in the um, field that we're in and we want to make the world a better place in terms of schools and things like that. So those are the sort of grandiose ideas. However, I think for a lot of academics, especially like about year four of a tenure line appointment and on, you start to feel like, hmm, why am I doing this work? What is this really all about? What impact am I having? And am I really reaching it? Is anybody out there? Is anybody actually reading what I've written out there? Because I don't really know for sure if I don't hear back from people and oftentimes you don't. So, um, so that got me thinking a lot more about public intellectualism and, and how, to, how to think through impact and how to think through um, how we can really make a more broad impact on policy making, on, on systemic change, and on broader issues of educationism. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So I have a piece, I'm not uh, real fond of reading generally, but this one was one that I wrote um, it was originally uh, created for a conference of deans, which is quite an experience, let me tell you. This was my first conference of deans. And um, I was invited to speak at this, which was, I was a little surprised as a first timer to be asked to do that, but I was honored and happy to do it. And uh, when speaking to a group, group of deans, one wants to choose one's words wisely. And so I was cautious and, and sort of where I might normally just kind of go off the cuff and talk about my work or talk about something like that. I really wanted to make sure that I crafted this particular message very clearly. And when I heard that we were talking about impact, I thought this is the right message to give to folks 
about how to have a more broad impact in our field. And so I wanted to, if you will indulge me for about 10 minutes approximately, I'll go ahead and read my commentary uh, on public intellectualism. This is where my thinking is currently around public intellectualism. So I'm gonna take the next few minutes to share with you all some thoughts that I have on educational public intellectualism. Public intellectualism is decidedly different from public scholarship. And here I wanna draw the distinction to focus on what public intellectual work is really about, how we can encourage educators to better engage in public intellectual work, and what it may mean in an age when journalism, TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines are nearly irrelevant. Most all scholarship that is published could, say to, could be said to be public because it is in the public sphere. However, the, for the past 75 years or so, action research has been highly interested in bringing to bear on policymaking as public scholarship. In contrast, public intellectuals are interested in sharing ideas broadly with the public writ large via big media. Henry Steele Comager, perhaps the grandfather of all public intellectuals and proposed as the original public intellectual by Neil Jumonville, saw the role as one of journalist and historian. Even today, this could be seen to be the case where Doris Kearns Goodwin may be among the most obvious examples of the old style public intellectual. Studying policy through the eyes of presidents, Kearns Goodwin, who I have had the good fortune to meet in person, shares her, shares her reflections frequently on network news TV shows such as Meet the Press. She is frequent author of books, as well as articles in high profile intellectual outlets such as The New Yorker, The Times, Vanity Fair, Washington Post, and more. But her name is virtually unknown to anyone under the age of 25. As this, generalization mature, as this generation matures, their public intellectuals will be a very different lot. It is important to note that public intellectuals are not simply journalists who quite often are not intellectual by their nature. So, while some folks say that John Stewart qualifies as our last great public intellectual, most of us would agree that he's not actually a public intellectual. The history of intellectuals more generally sees a movement from the Bohemians who abandoned their urban habitats of great, of great discomfort to move into university halls. With this move came a professionalization and specialization to a degree that the public sphere became almost irrelevant to the intellectual. Specialization brought fragmentation and career orientation followed by culture wars. One of the problems for educational intellectuals is the tendency to want to act. <clears throat> really, the public intellectual as defined in the past is precisely characterized as one of non-activity. Karl Mannheim's free-floating intellectual, Frisch Vivenda Intelligence, was illusory indeed, and Grazia's comparison of the public intellectual to Hamlet or Rodin's Le Penseur, the thinker, illustrate the exact nature of inaction that has perhaps steered so many educational intellectuals away from public intellectual work. Thus, inaction is critical, as is relatively solitary work. As Bruce Robbins puts it, if the public intellectual is to pursue something higher than publicity, the continuing communion with privacy is an inescapable part of her task. In addition, we are increasingly, as Schachtman convincingly argues, inarticulate as a society. Given this, perhaps unsurprisingly, Posner and many others have been decrying the end of the public intellectual for more than a dozen years. In his book, Public Intellectuals, A Study of Decline, Posner surveys a number of public intellectuals, including scholars, artists, and public officials, and calls them to task for low quality work. As David Brooks observed of Posner's critique, we stink, our logic is flawed, our use of evidence is shoddy, our rationalization is crude. The last Americanized list of public intellectuals was actually compiled around 2009 by Posner in his book on the topic. Since then, there have been several lists of global intellectuals, which is a broader category, and much more inclusive of thought leaders worldwide. The lists usually include people like Noam Chomsky, linguist, author, activist of the United States, Umberto Eco, a medievalist and novelist from Italy, Richard Dawkins, biologist and polemicist from Britain, Vaclav Havel, playwright, statesman from the Czech Republic. Christopher Hitchens, polemicist, United States, Britain. Paul Krugman, economist, columnist, United States. Jürgen Habermas, <clears throat> philosopher from Germany. Amartya Sen, economist from India. Jared Diamond, biologist, physiologist, historian from the US. 
and Salman Rushdie, author. If, if one were to look at pictures of all of these individuals, by the way, you'd see a large group of white men, pretty old. There's a couple of, um, there's one Indian, but otherwise, you know, notably no women and no people of color, uh, you know, beyond that one. And notably, there are no educators on the list. Perhaps they prefer to act, articulate, and socialize. The closest we get was when Jonathan Kozel was named as a dangerous professor on that dubious list from David Horowitz. In, generally, in general, we don't see many educators on lists of public intellectuals, and we generally keep our issues to ourselves. For example, this recent letter from Arne Duncan on the honors inflation among colleges of education was circulated to the NCTQ, that is the National Council for Teacher Quality, broadly, but only among those with an interest in teacher preparation, not more publicly. We need to ask ourselves, why is this the case and should it be the case? I would like to suggest, at least theoretically, that we are being held back from sincere engagement with public intellectual pursuits because we are having to occupy ourselves primarily in accountability tasks. <clears throat> that is, we are taking care of daily requests either within our institution or more commonly and time consumingly to accrediting agencies. Just like K-12 schools, we see so much time spent accounting for our time and efforts in an attempt to quantify learning, something I'd argue is largely impossible, that there is little left over for creative thinking. It may very well be the case that we see so few public intellectuals in many fields where accreditation is at play, business, accounting, psychology, medicine, even law, because the nature of accreditation sucks the intellectual life out of all of those fields. While it is clear these areas enjoy high vocational placement rates, it's worth asking if we've sold our humanities souls in exchange for these jobs. As Thoreau aptly points out, it is not enough to be busy, so are the ants. The question is, what are we busy about? So should we be busy about the business of public intellectualism? I would argue that it is critical for us to engage this level of debate and dialogue in society in order to focus on and offer significant potential remedies to real issues that matter. For educators to continue to feed a sense of anti-intellectualism within the field only allows for further degradation of the schools and universities which are already under attack. We need to create a strong class of educational intellectuals who will wrest from the Kardashians the minds of the millennials. So what will it mean for educational intellects to be culturally and intellectually relevant in the coming years? What would an educational public intellectual be and be about when millennials come of age? What are the responsibilities and opportunities? What should they avoid? And how can they add to the public conversation from an educator's space? I have merely a few thoughts that I can speak to from my own perspective and experience. My own work has been about progressive and potentially public scholarship ranging from stakeholder participation in parent teams for broad school change to work with prisoners, migrant workers, homeless, and African-American parents. I have worked to make that scholarship public and to have that work have specific impact on policies and policymaking. And there are significant upcoming opportunities that we may all share. We can, I hope, have significant impacts within our states on things like the go on rate among high school seniors, the integration of technology into classrooms, decreases in teacher education student populations, languishing teacher pipelines across states, impact of testing and accreditation on both K-12 schools and higher education, Educational public intellectuals must move to engage in more modern or millennial relevant TED Talks, social media, blogs, online magazines. These are the bits that the next level, that the next generation will indeed tune into. This is not without its issues. For example, this level of public intellectual who exists mostly on social media, are they really serious intellectual engagements? These are bits after all. In the same way that I consider M-learning, mobile learning, to be questionable in terms of its ability to really allow learning and reflection to happen at bus stops, I question the ability of these on-demand moments of public intellectualism to truly engage our minds and our thinking in the same way that an eight-page essay from The New Yorker might. Here it may make sense to connect to Nicholas Carr's assertions in the shallows that the internet is making us stupid. If so, and if the internet is the only place that the next generation of public intellectuals will exist, will that equate to an anti-intellectual turn? Is there anything we can do to reverse this tide? It is my belief that we have to actively engage social media and many channels of messaging if we have any hope of reversing the current trajectory in educational intellectualism and public intellectualism, which have yet to come together. So what does this mean as a practitioner of educational technology? 
We represent leaders across colleges, across higher education and in higher education and in public schools who should be impacting the public discourse on, of education on all levels. Moving to a public intellectual platform is a dangerous direction. It requires courage to take on potential reactions to controversial positions. The positions that public intellectuals take are often unpopular, controversial, and difficult. This kind of work makes for some very strange bedfellows at times and creates a tension that we must walk carefully. But in my view, at least, walk it we must. To abdicate this territory simply cannot be an option. Thank you. So, okay, can you hear everybody, me? Yes, was everybody able to hear? I saw some tired of uh, folks that are having trouble hearing maybe? I hope everybody could hear. <laughs> There was a little, there was a little spell of um, that jumped a little bit, but otherwise, uh, great, great stuff to kind of dig into. Loaded, obviously, <laughs> right? Um, but, but very fascinating nonetheless. So, how do I, how do I start this? I think that in terms of production, in terms of next steps, in terms of identifying how we move forward, I think what I, what I would particularly uh, was interested in was hearing that accreditation and accountability measures to kind of halt, halt and stunt the growth of innovation, That's and, uh, right. creativity, and and freedom and autonomy in the spaces and places that allow intellectuals to actually be creative. And I think that what I also heard was that there's this this hunger for using new age technologies to express yourself as an intellectual too. So using Facebook and, and MySpace and Twitter and, and going to those outlets to, to be allowed to um, explore and grow a little bit. Can you talk a little bit more about how public intellectuals that would be defined as, first of all, how, how would we define a true public intellectual, I think, um, or quasi, you know, who, who's in and who's out on public intellectuals, right? And then, how how might they use these technologies then to advance their causes a bit more? Can you kind of talk more about that? Let's see. So first, I want to make sure that I say that pu public scholarship is not public intellectualism. Public scholarship, mm -hmm. by its very nature, almost every scholarship that we put out into the world is public. And so um, lots of people in action research have been doing work around public scholarship for some time. Um, and, and have been trying to impact people's lives. My, my favorite, which I've pointed almost all of my advisees to, so I know Jason's heard of it before, <clears throat> is the North Bonneville Experience in Voices of Change book. And the Voices of Change book is a wonderful action research collection of edited chapters. And one of their stories is about a group of, you know, relatively um, rural folk who were going to be displaced by a, a, a dam that was going to flood their town and they were going to cease to have their town. And, um, you know, the question became, how, how are we going to save, you know, the, the, basically the Army Corps of Engineers said, we're taking it over and we'll give you fair value for your property and we're going to send you on down the river to the big city where you should have been in the first place because you shouldn't be here, you know, because this rural space is not okay for you to be in. Um, and we're seeing some backlash from that right now. I think the public, the, the most recent election is kind of an interesting example of, you know, people feeling kind of pushed around by some of this stuff. And so they said, no, we don't want to move to the big city. We live in a rural place. We want to maintain the quality and experience of living in a rural place. And so um, through some work with some university folks, they managed to figure out a way to, to tax the Army Corps of Engineers. And by doing that and combining that with their fair market value of their properties, they were able to reestablish themselves almost like a colony moving to another location. And, um, and, and, and then basically they mapped out all of the intersections between people and they made a better town. They made a town where people were more connected, people were more able to work with each other and so forth. So that would be to me an example of public scholarship because almost nobody's heard of this North Bonneville experience. Public intellectualism is uh, just turn on CNN, basically, right now. Although the, the thing is that when you talk about new technologies like, you know, Twitter and, and blogs and, and uh, TED Talks and so forth, 
that's where the millennials are. That's where the next generation of people who are interested in public intellectuals are. And so one has to ask if, if we've always just turned on CNN or NPR or places like that, or Fox News, frankly, to listen to public intellectuals, then where is, where's the next generation of public intellectuals going to be heard? Because basically millennials aren't listening to any of that noise. Does that help d sort of distinguish those things? Yes, I think so. <laughs> oh, Fantastic. So, so then we move to these ideas of, of, um, of agency, of agency and um, autonomy in your work. Can you talk about, you know, you, you have uh, pushed for the notions of user design in your work for, um, for students to have agency in their intellectual or rather educational pathways, to have more power in those spaces and places. So can you talk then to how the autonomy factor has to play a role in how we engage in intellectual property and intellectual advancements? I guess I'm not clear. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> as it, yeah, how, how does autonomy of people, right? So, your, your user design work talks to allowing allowing the learners to craft their own um, and support creating support systems around learners to craft their own educational pathways. So, how has this work then influenced um, your position and in, in how you came into this particular space that you're in now? So, you know, I think that, uh, and it kind of is related to what I was talking about earlier in terms of accreditation, right? Because I think that accreditation and accountability and this sort of hyper rational, we must measure everything that's measurable because measurable things are easily communicated and are very attractive, shiny things. Let's go for the measurable things, even when it doesn't really measure anything. It looks like it does, but it's not really measuring anything. So this sucks all the creativity out of teaching. And it's interesting, I was recently in a, in a, a meeting um, with some other deans and uh, people from the state and so forth. And, and the, the latest teacher education, teacher preparation regulations from the US government are, are now rolling out and everybody's trying to figure out how to respond to them. This is a public intellectual space. This is a space where what we do has impact. Um, and so so we look at this and we say, well, how do we design within that kind of a space? And, and in that meeting, it was very clear that it was all about these measurable, very narrow measurable outcomes. And I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm really kind of uncomfortable about this. I'm not sure that this is where, where we're going to see the best outcomes in terms of good teacher preparation. It worries me that we're getting into this, you know, kind of accountability space. And one of the people from the state said, well, welcome to the school. I mean, welcome to what the schools have been dealing with for a decade or more already. That This is their world. They're dealing with all this, you know, accountability and all, you know, so welcome to that. And I said, yeah, we wouldn't want, why would we want to replicate that in higher education? That seems like exactly the wrong, like what we, what we know is that that kind of, um, of, of accountability, that level of accountability that you're talking about there has, made it so hard to be a teacher that nobody wants to do it anymore. And we have, you know, all kinds of problems getting people into teacher education as a result. So why would we want to encourage that? So I think all of these things take away agency. And the, 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 and one might say, why is agency, why are we losing agency? Why is the education environment losing agency? And there could be lots of different explanations for this. Um, you know, feminists will forward the idea that as long as men were in charge of, of the teachers, they, it was okay. And then once we got more and more women involved, it became less and less. It, we got paid less, we got less respect, all that kind of thing. I don't think that accounts for what's happened in the last 15 years because it's been a female dominated population for quite some time now in education. So I don't really think that that's the reason for the over, you know, over accountability, but for sure what I think we're seeing is more and more political interest in these measurable things, which are sort of robbing us of our human soul, our humanities, you know? Um, and so that, that really, really worries me. I don't know how necessarily we solve that, 
But, you know, I, I think that a public intellectuals within this space are called on to try to figure out ways to communicate to people that what happens inside of a classroom, you know, is, is something that is, is immeasurable and when it works well is magic and art and not just science, not just techno-rational measurable chunks of learning. Um, I remember very early in my career when I was first a, a, a reviewer, getting a paper that talked about measuring learning per second. And I thought, that is just crap. You know, I mean, what, there's no way to measure learning per second. Can you, you know, over time, can you measure learning by looking at standardized test scores? One would argue that that would be, I guess, one um, measure of something. Um, I would argue that it's probably not really learning. I suspect it's more like memorization or um, uh, being being compliant, maybe um, you know, following directions, maybe knowing how to take tests. Uh, there's lots of good evidence that we can train people how to take tests, uh, none of which I would argue is really all that helpful in the world. It's interesting to me, you know, my kids are in middle school and high school now, and I look at the math that they're doing, and I, I don't want to tell them this, but the reality is I, I remember learning all that math. They will never use it. They're, I don't remember. I, on, in my daily life, there's lots of math I use, um, but I don't use these sort of very structured, measurable, algorithmic kinds of, you know, algebraic and trigonometry and calculus. And on, in my daily life, I don't really use that. My father was a physician. And he went all the way through math. And he told me Latin was a whole lot more useful to me than math ever was because all I did for math, I, I looked everything up in the, in the physician's desk reference in terms of, of how to make a prescription. I never like weighed somebody and calculated what a prescription was going to be. The most I ever did was addition and subtraction in my ledger book at the end of the day to see whether or not I, I could balance the books and had made any money that day. That's all he really did as a physician. He said math is a sorting machine. That's what math and science are. They're a way to sort out the people that we want to be physicians and have a little bit higher income from the people who aren't allowed to do that stuff because they didn't master that math. So I don't know, I'm kind of going off a little bit here, but it seems off topic a little bit here, but it seems to me like a lot of what's happening around agency is that the sorting machine and the measurable stuff is getting in the way of letting people really do what they would most like to do. So some people have asked me, in this world of free agency, of, of, of a, a place where it's really user design, do you, what kind of a school, what does your school look like, Allie? And I'll say, you know what, a school that I would create probably would look a lot like, there's a, there is an example of this out in, I believe it's Harrisburg, I think it's called the, it's either called the Circle School or the Key School, I'm not sure which. And it's, it's truly a democratic school, kids walk in there at four or five years of age, full of curiosity, and we don't kill it. We don't rob them of that curiosity. We let them explore everything that they're interested in. And we let go of saying, I know what's best for you. I'm going to tell you your curriculum. And so if a kid wants to spend six months playing a video game, they let him. And inevitably, they don't play video games for the rest of their, work, of their lives because it's not really something that, I mean, they, they recognize that, well, that, you know, I can amuse myself to death, as Neil Postman would say. But that's not really what I want to do with my life. I want something that's, you know, more fulfilling. And so although they're learning a lot of good stuff in that, in that gaming in environment, oftentimes they will move on to other stuff. They will start linking up what they're doing inside the games to other learning in, in, in quote unquote real subjects. Um, so, you know, for me, it would be a place a lot like Montessori, you know, very open, very full of agency for the people inside of the system, including teachers, parents, and kids. So, there we go. Oh, you found the circle school. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. Thank you for finding that for us. Yeah, we do. Yeah, I see what you're saying, Elizabeth, in terms of, of, of higher level math skills. So um, it's true. Music makes our brains work differently. Math makes our brains work differently. Language arts makes our minds work differently. Learning a new language will also make our minds work differently. But math is the only one that we care about when it comes to sorting people. Um, math, science, technology, engineering, those are the only ones that allow you to have access to higher levels of income. Um, a person who's very, very adept with Shakespearean literature 
does not, in my opinion anyway, uh, has a very different part of their brain that's working from a math person perhaps, but it doesn't mean that they get the same rewards in society. So it's not so much that I'm against math, I'm certainly not against math. My, my point is that we have somehow in our society, through policymakers mostly, which is why I come back to public intellectualism as important work, through policymakers and the politics of our society, we have valued, and really this started with the space race, you know, that's, that's where it comes from. Um, the nation at risk and the space race and our worries that the Russians were going to beat us. Um, and so as a result, we valued math, science, engineering, and technology over almost everything else. And as a result, everybody else whose brains maybe worked differently, and Howard Gardner, of course, defends this in, in his multiple intelligences work, those folks all got relegated to another place. And if you look at the difference between what, say, a, a physician makes and an English professor makes, you would be shocked to see the difference. So I, I don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying. It does make things work differently. Um, but so does learning to write script, for instance. Um, and I would argue that learning to write script is not really a useful task, a, a useful skill any longer in our society. Yet it's important to tr train our brains how to do that in the same way that it's important to train our brains how to listen to and produce blues music. But only a few of those things actually make any money and are actually valued by society. So that, that's my larger concern. Oh, Elizabeth is agreeing. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that. I, I'm, I hope I answered that question. That's great. Um, let's see. Good question from Shiganti. I hope I'm saying your name correctly on how do we use these techniques with special needs children? Um, I think that this is a really important question and one that I haven't spent a lot of time looking at. So I would, I would, be, I would be cautious to say too much in this regard. Um, but, but my experience with special needs children is that they have interests just as much as anybody else. Sorry. Oops, sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. Um, so yeah, that they, that they have, they have interests and we should be encouraging those rather than just tracking them solely into say, I see a lot of, um, a lot of emphasis on life skills sort of curricula as they get, you know, as, as special needs kids get older. Um, I also think that we may have some over diagnoses of things at times. Most kids have interests and I think I'm, I'm very much in favor of um, the, the inclusion uh, notion of how to handle kids in schools. I think that we should be more inclusive rather than um, pull out programs where we can. And, and so my tendency is to feel that special needs children would be handled just kind of like everybody else. Um, and that we would, we would have to be very um, thoughtful about making sure that the people around them are responding properly. That would be my, my, my larger concern. Um, in, an, in an open space, um, and again, I, I, I think that, you know, for some of us, and I know not everyone is going to be on the same page on this, but for some of us, the presidential election is pretty fresh and, and a little bit worrisome. Um, particularly for anyone who's vulnerable. And so for me, a special needs population in an open sort of agency filled space is a vulnerable population that I would be very cautious and thoughtful about and wanting to make sure that we are um, not allowing any kind of inappropriate behavior, bullying, uh, degradation of, of them or anything like that. So I don't know whether that helps or not answer that for you, Shikanti, but hopefully a little bit. Let's see. Should I keep looking at these questions, Jason, or am I supposed to wait for you to ask? Sure. You're, you're, you're doing fantastic. You can run the show. You got it. You're, you're great at it. saying that because you have to be nice because I was your advisor. Okay, let's see. Um, Alex. Do you think that the use of open educational resources can help develop a better awareness of individual learning spaces, producing them, using them, et cetera? Alex Colburn asked this question. Yes. Um, so open educational resources are really an interesting thing, actually. And um, I think the work that David Wiley is doing in this space is probably the best. So he would be a great person to ask that question better than me. But for me, I think for sure, um, moving away from sort of the traditional um, textbooks, Mike Apple has done some absolutely amazing work on teachers and text. If you haven't seen anything that Mike Apple's written, he's a scholar out of the University of Wisconsin Madison, and his very old textbook, his very old book now on teachers and texts, um, is the name of the book, and it's it's a great analysis of how our curriculum 
um, and how our textbooks come to be what they are based largely on being driven by large populations. And so Texas and California sort of drive the, the textbook market because there's such large states. And since textbook adoption is still often at the state level, um, you, see these, you see these large states kind of controlling the content inside of those textbooks. And then people who aren't from that state are like, I have no idea, I'm from Alabama. I don't know what any of this stuff is about. This is about Texas or this is about, you know, some population that I'm not familiar with. Um, so that's interesting. That's an interesting analysis. And um, yeah, I bet that's probably it, uh, Jennifer. I bet that's, I bet that's probably it. Um, <clears throat> so the, the move to open educational resources gets us away from this kind of politicization of the way that textbooks are adopted, the way that curricula are designed. When we move to more and more um, individual agency as well, we have a really great opportunity to engage kids in making stuff. Um, including making books. So I have a, a really exceptional faculty member here at the University of Idaho. Her name is Margaret Vaughn, and she's been doing work with Native American tribes, American Indian tribes, um, working on producing books, children's books, in languages that are about to be lost, right? She's a, she's a literacy person, and so she's looking at some of the Native American, American Indian languages that are about to be that are about to be just washed out or lost completely, or even going back to languages that are not being used, kind of like Latin, um, what we would think of as a dead language, um, to try and rejuvenate that and put it into children's books, which has been really, really cool. And she's created not only hard copies of these picture books, but also she's engaged, and, and her student teachers and the kids inside of the tribal schools have been involved in making those books. But in addition to that, there are some online interactive books that she's been working on making with the teachers, the student teachers, and the, um, and the kids. And it, it, just amazing work. Her name was Margaret Vaughn, V-A-U-G-H-N, I believe. And, um, and so some of the work that she's been doing around language and literacy is, a, I think, a really good example of how we could use open source to really um, engage kids in making their own stuff that gives them a sense of place, um, a sense of importance and pride in, in who they are, the culture that they come from, the world that they live in, a sort of culturally uh, sensitive curriculum making um, that they can be engaged in. So yes, I think open source is a really good possibility. Now that said, I have a confession, and that is I usually don't publish in open source materials. Um, the problem with open source from the academic standpoint is that it tends to not have the same shiny status as a journal like Harvard Ed Review or, um, you know, a book publisher like Sage or Rutledge or one of those. And so that's, that's one of the problems I think um, that we have and something that I think that we really need to pay close attention to um, in terms of the open source movement. It's a good movement. I think it, it gives people a lot of agency. And so I'm really excited to see that. What I'm not sure of is how we deal with the politics of publishing such that we get people on board who want to participate and want to put their stuff out there for free. Like academics don't make any money really on anything that we write. We, we put our stuff out there in journals and we don't get paid anything. Sometimes we have to pay to publish, which by the way, my advice to any burgeoning academics out there is don't ever pay to publish. But, um, but you know, there are people who are doing that and it's becoming more and more common in other fields like engineering and physical sciences and so forth. Um, but you know, we, I, I see that we have, that is something that academics don't make any money on. And the argument that we make any money on textbooks is laughable. I mean, we really don't make very much money on, we don't make enough to keep it off of the, out of the open stream. Um, but the problem is that it, it's, it's not about the finances of it for the academic, it's about the status of it for the academic and how other people read their work. So there you go. Oh, we found Margaret. Excellent. Yeah, I just, I popped her up there. Thank um, you. So we got Margaret Vaughn and it's Margaret with the M-A, I must spelled it. That's but okay. we're coming to the end of our time here and I just, um, we're a little bit over, but that's fine. It was a very I'm enlightening. So sorry. I thought I, I, thought oh, I had an hour. Fine. I oh, you, <laughs> you're fine. It was wonderful. It was inspired, enlightening, and as usual, I very you. pleasant. I love so, you. Thank you so great. much for the invitation. I'll do it again anytime. I hope everybody has a great day. Enjoy the webinar, everyone. Yeah.
Oh, it's thank you. Email. Oh, shoot. It's... That was so quick. I was just going to ask her a question. Is she gone? <laughs> I'm still on. No, I we can ask that. her one more question. Yeah. We yeah, can ask yeah, her one yeah. more question. Well, first of all, I just super duper duper want to thank you for joining us on a Saturday and just in general, what we're so glad to hear from your thoughts. And so the question of the day for everybody is what impact will you make? And I don't know, did you have a chance to answer yeah. that question? Like what, what do you want to be your mark? I don't know that I, well, you know, it's interesting. I think, um, what would I want to be my mark? That's tough. You know, there's it a is. It's a biggie, right? Well, and for me right now, I'm so in the middle of a transition that I don't know yet. Like I, I just got asked to be put in charge of um, the, the go on, the research that's being done here at the University of Idaho on the go on rate. So in the state of Idaho, we have a very low rate of high schoolers that go on for higher education and in particular men. So we have a big, a huge uh, gender gap between uh, men and women in terms of the go on rate. And the president just called me into his office and said, I want you to pursue this with all, you know, vigor and vim. And so you know, I, it might be that I'll have an impact at a state level on that. I'm involved in a big grant right now that has to do with district level systemic change in the state of Idaho, um, funded by the state and by the legislature. Um, so I hope that those are things that will, will bear great fruit. Um, you know, I think I might always be the boys and game guy, uh, girl, whatever. Um, you know, so I, I, that person, I, I can't imagine very much of what I do in terms of my research and, and such will ever reach as many people as that one TED talk. So I might always be that person, but I'm hoping to make another mark as I go forward here at, you know, out here in Idaho. And, um, and so I guess I, we'll see. I think I don't have an answer to what my impact will be yet. I hope, I hope I don't have an answer yet. Well, you know what my takeaway from everything you said is um, challenge yourself to try new things because <laughs> it's really easy to become an expert in something and then that's the thing you do for 40 years and it's just awesome <laughs> to watch. No, I'm not interested in doing that. <laughs> it's so, so awesome that you're- I, I want to model friend. myself after David Jonathan who was constantly doing uh, new uh. stuff. I also just would want to um, mention briefly before we break that um, if nobody has mentioned it to the group and if there hasn't been any um, um, memoriam moment, uh, I don't know how many people are aware that Larry Lips has passed just in the last week or so. And um, he was a, a, just a giant in our field. Um, clearly his legacy is the educational technology magazine that so many people get. This is um, the, the non, uh, it's a non-refereed, unbelievably high quality magazine that got a lot of the newest latest and greatest stuff out because it didn't it didn't take a year to get things published in there and i had a couple of special issues on things like cyber charter schools and so forth in his in his um magazine and he just passed so um it was i was really really sad to hear of this news yeah. and in case um, others don't know about it already i just wanted to pass it on to everybody i think in the uh, facebook the p p p i d t i'll try to find his obituary but um yeah that's a biggie that's a biggie for sure was he pushing our, our tech our piece for our i don't know what's happening i don't know what's happening with our, oh, wow. with our special issue so we'll have to we'll have to kind of stay on wow. that i don't know how to communicate with him we at the magazine we so. were working we were working with him Closely did. Yeah, I, um, I don't know when uh, they'll when they'll shift or change their their um, publication. I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know, but we need to try and figure out how to <laughs> how to how to reconnect with that because I assume that that was in the pipeline. Yes, so much, I'm trying but, to find know, it. This is kind of more important. Him and his, his legacy. Wow. Yeah, here it is. Okay. I started to end on such a sad note, but oh, I'm really good. I'm glad you mentioned it. That's good. Thank you very right. much. Have a great day. Thank you. Well, Bye -bye. thank you so Bye -bye. much. Well, we'll be in touch. Bye.